Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is uh, Reverend Steve, the founder of the Church of Edwood, and an all-around nice guy, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he is a nice guy. Uh, and you did a great blog post the other day, too. Yes, uh, I, I, I did that blog post because I have... Um, I, I used to work in the children's department of, of the children's department of, in California. I was, and then I moved to Oklahoma in a managerial position, but I recently got it back like around November, December, around there. So I myself getting back into the swimming manager type person. There was some over guy who who seemed to be following me all day. Yeah. Yesterday, and, and he just he he must have been in the store about five times while I was working, and he never talked to anyone else but me. And he followed me around, and he kept asking me questions, and he just kept getting close to me and it reminded me of uh, of something that happened when I was in uh, uh we had a store that was close to a homeless shelter and close to like a like a like a tent city shanty town area so we had a lot of problems at our location that other people didn't have what we He's like, oh, hey, what do we do about the three homeless people just run into the store and good from our Godiva display and then run out? And it happened like about five seconds, just just a, just ran into our store, grabbed a ton of chocolate and ran out. Yeah, it just had like it happened like like a, like the snap of a finger. Just suddenly we were, were attacked by homeless. <laughs> like like a like a flock of seagulls. It was amazing, and one of the one of the things that happened this crazy homeless and tweaker guy who thought I was the the handsomest guy in the world and kept following me and and staring at me and he would stay in the children's department for just hours staring at me and it was creepy as hell and. And I I tried to make it a a big deal, like, hey, there's this guy and he he keeps following me around and I'm getting nervous and everyone just laughed it off. Right. It's like, oh you have a oh, somebody likes you. Oh, isn't that funny? But if I was a girl, mm-hmm. it would have been the biggest deal in the freaking world. And that's a really messed up kind of that's a really messed up uh what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, double standard. Yeah. Yeah. Woman's getting sexually harassed. Oh my God! Let's call HR and corporate, and let's get let's get security. But a guy's getting sexually harassed, and oh well, isn't that funny? Oh man, who's the guy? I want to see what he looks like. Oh my God! Tell me next time. Mm-hmm. I had so ju- funny. I had just seen a little video that somebody posted uh, on Facebook, and I'll. 
have to post it on your timeline so you can see it. And it just kind of reminded me of that that story on your blog. Uh, I didn't have the sound on, so I don't know what they were arguing with. But this woman comes up to this guy, grabs him, drags him in the street, starts yelling at him, and slapping him. Like, multiple, like she must have slapped him 20 fucking times. And I wasn't listening to the audio, so I don't know what the fight was about. They were, they were apparently boyfriend and girlfriend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And I was just kind of, you know, and he was doing everything, you know, he was trying not to do anything back or anything like that. And I was just kind of thinking like, okay, exactly how many times does she have to slap me before I knock her on the pavement? You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not, I don't really approve of hitting women, but if you are literally slapping the piss out of me, at some point I have got to have the right to defend myself. Yeah, that's a one. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's no, that's fair. That is absolutely. Yeah. And especially, and with me, it would be like, you know what? That is simply just the end of this relationship. So whatever you're screaming about, you can fucking stop. (laughs) Because it doesn't matter anymore. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So, how has your week been? Um,. I'm old, so I've been feeling like really run down all week. So yeah. not particularly a great week. I'm gonna take a couple of days off uh, Monday and Tuesday this week. So this coming week, hopefully, I can uh, recover a little. Cool, 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 cool. Um, oh yeah. Um, this is kind of funny. Um, so we have a little mystery going on. With one of our Pokemon films, I think I've solved it. Do you have any idea which episode is our top episode on YouTube now? Uh, don't look. Uh, don't cheat. So I, I assume it's the Guardians of the Galaxy episode, but I don't know. It's Babes in Toyland. Babes in Toyland? It's, it's over 500 views now. Now, granted, people are not viewing long. Yeah. And I kind of looked at this a little bit. I tried to, I, you know, I went looking to find out, like, where the hits are coming from because you can get the data from YouTube. Yeah. And it said it's on the YouTube. They, they're coming from the YouTube uh, suggestion page. And I'm like, okay, you know, they must have popped it on the front page for a day or something like that. YouTube does that. Uh, yeah. But this has been going on for fucking days now. This has been going on probably for over a week. Well, it's probably been going on since we put the episode up, actually. Yeah. Here's what I think. Here's is my... It be- is it because I start out the episode talking about a porn? I don't think so. My my okay. theory is is that if you're in YouTube and you do a search, then anything that comes up in the search is considered a suggestion page. Or one of the suggestion page, or if you you know you're looking at some other video and you get the videos down on the sidebar, yeah, uh, those are the suggestion pages basically. I think they're searching for babes. Ah, I think okay. people are out there searching for babes, and they they look over and they see our icon or something like what? The fuck? That guy's got a mustache. That's got that guy's got a beard. This is beard. This has got to be porn. nice very nice they're only listening for like 10 to 15 seconds (laughs) (laughs) but still a hit is a hit so yay yes it is it most certainly is I'm not crying over it anything but it's just odd do you know what top country these views are coming from Russia you're close okay Bulgaria Um, Really? Bulgaria. Yeah, so I'd like to give a big shout out to all our Bulgarian fans. <laughs> I I I don't this is gonna sound like a like a like a link and I don't mean it to be a link. Yeah. Stuff all I can think of are like the, the wild and crazy guys. Oh yeah. Oh my so god, I, yeah. 
But now they're older and they're on a computer and they're like, we need to go look for videos of foxes. <laughs> oh, yes, my brother. Let us go on YouTube and so That's what I'm thinking is going on here. We in my head, it, at least. In the name of science, uh, we science. should run a little experiment and do a review if we could find it. I'm pretty sure it was called Little Foxes with uh Ooh. was that with Jody Shirley Temple? Jody Foster no, Jody oh. Foster and Christy McNichol. I'm pretty sure. Is that the one where they're both trying to get laid during I, I don't, summer? I don't think I've ever seen it, but you know, Fox would be in the title of the show. That's a good we, point. And we would see how many uh how many views that gets. We've gotta find we've gotta find some sort of like a movie that sounds an awful lot like porn and then do that as a movie when we just to see. Any movies with tit in the title? <laughs> yeah. Like Tit for Tat or There's a documentary on the Bare Naked Ladies. We could do that. Ah that Okay. That would work. I'm familiar with them, but I get them confused with Alien Animals. Because they were kind I've, of they were kind of both popular like right at the same time. And they both had a certain kind of weirdness. The, I've seen the documentary and it's all right. It's done by Jason Priestley, which is weird. Yeah. No, it's a good documentary because Jason Priestley did the documentary because he's Canadian and he was the sh- most people in on the planet think of Canada than they thought of Celine Dion. And so he thought, oh, what a horrible person to be the face of our country. Let's try and give uh-huh. them another face. So he made a documentary on the Bare Naked Ladies and followed them around and everything. And so it's it's like it's cute. I never liked the Bare Naked Ladies, but then I was forced to go to one of their concerts, and they were quite amazing. They were quite amazing. Yeah. Seeing them live won me. I've never been in another band that's done that. I care about you, but oh, hey, live, you, you guys are freaking wonderful. Yeah. It doesn't happen to me. So, ha- large amounts of. Okay, you were telling us about. Yes. Okay. So everybody's getting licensed, and like oldest daughter is getting licensed, and then youngest daughter is getting uh, youngest son is getting licensed, and then youngest daughter is getting licensed again. And I keep, I, I'm a paranoid man. I am like like a highly paranoid man. So anytime I have the slightest itch, I'm like, oh god, it's because everyone around me is getting licensed, but apparently lice because as a latino man it is deeply embedded in my brain to constantly wear 50 pounds of hairspray and apparently since i wear so much hairspray and so much like gel and stuff that lice can't exist on my (laughs) that is just have a lice a i have i have like lice hell on my head yeah, and so lice are just completely staying away from me because they can't do it because I have so much hairspray. So, so you, then your head is kind of a a lice free zone, yeah. so that if there were uh, clans of warring lice, you know, like if Maxwell lice's lice was fighting with Emerald lice, then they would send dignitaries to your hair to try to talk it out and come to some kind of a peaceful resolution. Yeah, and my head is where the lice would meet to yes. talk about their plans. Yes. <laughs> so that makes me so that makes me just want to put more hairspray on my hair. Yeah. Just to be safe. Like like oh no, I haven't put hairspray on for today. I mean you know? I'm killing ozone <laughs> in my house right now with the amount of hairspray that I am putting on my head because the hairspray is the only thing keeping me from uh, infestation, which is surrounding me, it is horrible. Like me. 
It's really bad. It's 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 not pleasant. So you're saying okay. one of the one of the holes in the ozone that we have, we should just name after you. Yes, one of them is me. <laughs> and so there you go. Yay. Today's this week's this week's episode, I'm gonna try and keep it in. I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and keep my it, how do I say this? I am a huge Saturday Night Live fan. Me too. Yeah. I am a huge, huge fan. So I'm going to try and not geek out over this episode. Oh, geek out if you must. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm wrong I, with a little geeking out. You know. Yeah. It's just I'm such a huge, huge fan of Saturday Night Live. That it's it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult for me to keep it in. Yeah. You said last week that you haven't really since Charlie Rocket. Oh no 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 no! I I stopped watching later than that. No, I was just saying that the Charlie Rocket was such a such a gut punch. Um, yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was he... also was also the bad guy in Dumb and Dumber. Charlie was, Rocket was. If you remember, he was David Addison's brother on Moonlighting for a couple of episodes. Here. Yes, yes, remember that now. But I have always, I've hated, absolutely hated, Dumb and Dumber. He's in Dances with Wolves. Really, I've never yeah. seen that. It just never. It just Dances with Wolves never seemed entertaining to me. Yeah. I never bothered to watch it. I I like it, but I've kind of seen it enough, you know? Yeah. I've seen it a few times. So I could probably do it without ever seeing it again. But he is um, like a captain of the cavalry toward the end of the movie. Really? Yeah. So, it, and it's just like, it's just like, he's one of those guys who pops up in movies and, and it's just like, Okay, who the hell are you? Yeah. What are you got, like, doing in this movie? You you must hey, have relatives in the business. You have to. Yeah. You he's know? got this strange face. Like, he's he's almost too chiseled in the facial region. Yeah. yeah. Like, he, he looks bizarre. You know what? Do you, do you happen to remember Quake Serial? Crisp and Quake. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember that. I think I only remember it from like a weird old things like Mr. Lobo. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cause, yeah, was, I was a kid when they stopped making shit. Um, yeah, I, you would have to Google it then in that case. But Charles Rock, Charlie Rocket would be the best casting if you were going to do a live action Quake movie. <laughs> I swear to all that. Yeah, we have to yeah. up a little, but you know. But yeah, I always wonder. <laughs> I always wonder who the fuck he is and where, where does he come from. I sort of have the same thing about Billy Zane. Oh, he has a soft spot in my heart. Yeah. I love that man. Well, I love he, that man. Of what he did for uh, Ed Wood. Yes, he. What was that? I haven't seen it. But... I woke up early the day I died. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of those movies where I think I paid fifty dollars to get like a germ a German copy of the movie on VHS, mm. and and it had like German subtitles. I mean, the whole film is like silent, but I was so proud to finally get a copy of the movie. And then what? A decade later, it's all free on YouTube. Yeah. Oh God. I'm pretty sure that it's still there too. Yeah. Pretty sure that it's still there. I really want to do um Ed Wood's Orgy of the Dead. Because I love that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That is that, that one's already in my queue. So cool. I'm all ready for that. Um so for the documentary, uh I stopped, well, I actually stopped watching somewhere after the Phil Hartman era. Um, yeah. I used to catch some of the 
clipped down episodes that Comedy Central would play, so I saw some of the Will Smith stuff. Will Smith, uh, Will Ferrell. Stuff. Yeah. And probably not much past that. Okay. I see where you're. I see where you're. Uh, where you're at here. Yeah, I, I. Well, I. I. After the original cast, I pretty much stopped watching. You know, I watched some of the Eddie Murphys. Okay. And then yeah. at some point there, I completely stopped watching. But I was flipping channels during the Phil Hartman era, and there was this guy who three names sandy blonde hair used to do like editorial um oh a whitney brown a whitney brown yes um and i googled that like that was just in my head how weird is it that a whitney brown was in my head wow (laughs) and i stopped for a second and he did this editorial where he basically ripped Saturday Night Live itself into asshole. Where he was, he was just like, this show used to have balls. This show uh, used to not care what the censors thought. This show used to be like guerrilla program. And I was yeah. like, well, I might have to check this out again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's Phil Hartman, John Lovett. So that's what yeah, was that. so I think that was uh that was that era with uh what's his name uh Dennis Miller. Uh yes, definitely Dennis Miller. Back yeah. when, he, when he was funny. Yeah, now he's kind of turned into like a like a like a right wing comedian. Yeah. I think he does or does things for uh, money. I believe he did. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's surprising to me because I can't think of the guy who was so radical and radically against uh, Ronald Reagan in the 80s on yeah. Saturday Night Live. What was that noise? What did I do? Did you I hear that? I heard that. That one was on your side. I don't okay. know what that was. It was kind I think of I just kind gave, of cool. I think I just gave a fairy its wings. I know an angel. I just gave an angel its wings, guys. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I have I have some lists here. Like I, I, I feel that in order to talk about this documentary this week, that we need to talk about the history of Saturday Night Live, and I've got some really good lists of uh, interesting things that I find interesting about Saturday Night Live, and then we can get into the documentary and all that. But first, I want to go through some of these lists. Okay. I have a list. Here. I have a list here of all of the feature length films that have been based on Saturday Night Live skits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. They've made eleven Saturday Night Live movies. Yeah. Say the names of these movies, and then we're just going to give like a really quick one word review of whether this is good or bad or eh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the first one. The Blues Brothers. Yes. Uh, I love them. Yes. In that time period, Animal House stole my affection. So I didn't get yeah. into the Blues Brothers um, as much as I probably should have. Animal House was more in your face. Blues Brothers was, was more like subtle and more music oriented and kind of almost like quiet. There's like yeah. a quiet humor to the Blues Brothers. But I like the Blues Brothers. Yeah. I mean, as far as an SNL movie goes, I like the Blues Brothers. I am going to predict right now that it's probably going to be the best one on the rest of the list. Probably, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. Have you seen It's Pat the Movie? I was horrified that it came out. <laughs> I, I really like the Pat skits. I find them really funny. But like an hour and a half at a minimum of that same one shtick. Yeah. It's it's like making a movie out of the copier guy. You know what's interesting? The Blues Brothers came out in 1980 and then 
a live movie until 1992 with Wayne's World. That's that's a that's a 12 year gap between Saturday Night Live movies. That's surprising. Really, I, but yeah. the next film, but the next film is Wayne's World. Fun movie. It is a fun, fun movie, but I tried to watch my kids and I believe that this was big. You know? It's like I imagine it's like I imagine my young is like 39, like showing the kids it just and saying, No, no, this guy was huge back then. And everybody's like, Really? Yeah. This was this was big. Wayne's World 2, I thought, was a really good movie, but I think that was just because of how much it made fun of the movie The Doors. <laughs> yeah. um, but, how, how close, I wonder, was the release of Wayne's World to Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? I remember them kind of being kind of on the close side. Uh, I do not know. In about... Uh, 10 seconds because Wayne's World came out in 1992 uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure came out in 89 Oh, okay. so it's fairly close ish yeah, fairly close but not enough to say that, you, that they rushed Wayne World out the door yeah because Bill and Ted made good bank yeah and then Wayne's World 2 came out the next year. Three. That seems drastic. Mm. Equal. So they must have really rushed that Wayne's World 2 out. <laughs> yeah. I, I, with, with comedies, I would think that you would want to get them out quick. I would think that, that people would not be as willing to wait on the next comedy as they would like to get into this. Yeah. This comedy has, uh, has the tendency of just cooling down. The next film, the next Saturday Night Live, Coneheads. The Coneheads. Um, That's a cute movie for what it is, but it came out two decades late. Mm-hmm. And I never particularly found the Coneheads all that funny. Nice. And it was the movie is cute. Yeah, movie, but it was very monstrous. Yeah, I don't know why the Conehead movie came out in '93. It's not like people still had Conehead on their brain, you know? Yeah, yeah, but you know, Dan Aykroyd had to pay off his dealer. <laughs> okay, so next is Charlie Rocket is in that too. Which one? Parent. Uh, it's Pat. It's Pat. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the next one. I've never seen that. I've ne never seen this movie. Although I did hear as an uncredited writer on the script. At least according. So Quentin Tarantino helped write the It's Pat movie. <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah, no, that's that's when I can give a pass for it forever. You know, cut it up into clips. Let me let me watch it on YouTube. You know. Yeah. Too much Pat is not a good thing. Yeah, I've heard that it's okay, but I, no, I can't, I can't, I can't get myself to watch that. Uh, next is 1995, Stuart Saves His Family. I have not heard that, but I heard it. It's, it's actually very good. Yes, I have heard that as well. I've heard that it's supposed to be all right. It has an actual story that they're following through, and he saves his family. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm going to have to find that one and watch it one day. It's also who was right there around the creation of Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Himself like a big character. 
they're in a huge hit half decades after the creation of Saturday Night Live. You know what I'm saying? That's odd to me. That is really, really weird. It's like, really? Al Franken? That's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine he was a good writer. Any of the old Al Franken bits that they used to do? Yeah, and Franken were... and David. Yeah, I, I didn't find them terribly funny. Yeah. yeah. But when he did Stuart Smalley, I thought that was just hysterical. Yeah. Odd. Uh, next is 1998's A Night at the Roxbury. Have you seen that? I have not seen that. I can't imagine a movie of characters who do that shit with their head. Yeah. Yeah. I've tried to see it a number of times, but I, I, I've never been able to sit down and, and see that movie. And then in 1998, they made a second Blues Brothers movie. Uh, and wasn't that Blues Brothers 2000? 2000. Yeah, Blues Brothers with Dan Aykroyd and John Goodman. Yeah, that is, uh, that's, that's almost disrespectful. You know what I mean? I mean, I love yeah, John Goodman, but you can't replace, and that, that's obviously what he is. I haven't seen it, but, you know, you can't replace John Bellucci, you know? No, you cannot. You absolutely cannot. You know? It's messed up. And the one thing that I always think back on, since we're on the John Bellucci train now, um, that kind of, every time I think about it, it kind of chills me out a little, cause it, like gives me a chill, like a little haunted. On the original Saturday Night Live, they had, John Belushi had done a short film. The one film. where, yeah, the one where he's an old man. Uh huh. Of everybody. Yeah. Yeah, and he's yeah. going through the I, graveyard. I had to know. Yeah, that guy had to have. That guy had to have known what his future was going to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In order to have the the foresight to make a skit like that, like when. You know, the old WWE, the day before he died. Right. Which one? And he did this big, beautiful speech, buddy. The Ultimate Warrior. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I heard about he that. Never, he hadn't been on, he hadn't been on a, WWE, a WWE show for decades. And when he finally came back, he did this big, long, beautiful speech about mortality. And then less than 24 hours later, he had a heart attack and died. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right up there with that that weirdo skit. I think from the first season of Saturday Night Live. That was definitely the first season of Saturday Night Live. Well, first yeah. the second. That, if I'm not mistaken, they only did two seasons. The original cast, possibly three. Chevy Chase left at, in the second. He, he, he he left, left, yeah, he left after the first season. Yeah. Because he's kind of a dick. He was, the first person, he was the first person to believe that world would eventually be highly unsuccessful. So he really was a trailblazer. Yes. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, you know, the show was huge when it hit. You know, like Saturday Night Live, that first season. They would do spots about Saturday Night Live on like 60 Minutes and things like that. It was a big yeah. thing. You know, so I came in like partway into that first season, and right after the first season, Chevy Chase got a huge head and left. Yeah, Replaced pretty much. Bill Murray. That, what a wonderful person to be replaced by, though. That's one. If you ever got a place. Chevy Chase, someone, you pick the right guy. Yeah, and you know what? I have a strong suspicion. Can't prove it, but every now and then, every now and then, Bill Murray will ring up Chevy Chase and just be like, "You know, just relaxing in the jacuzzi. Uh, how you doing, Chevy?" Because <laughs> <laughs> Bill Murray is like one of the biggest thing 
a two cup of tea. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I would get the feeling he was with a pole from time to time. He was kind of digging in a little. Yeah. I'm not going okay, to go next... golfing tomorrow. Uh, having my limo <laughs> waxed. <laughs> but we'll do it next. Week. Oh, don't worry. You, you fuck God, up, little them. buddy. <laughs> I love Bill Murray so much. Uh, The next film is 1999's Superstar. I have a little bit of a soft spot in my heart for this. Um, The Mary Catherine Gallagher movie? Yes. Um, My wife, who had passed away, we we were incredibly poor because she had mental issues and wasn't able to work, so she was my salary. Um, So she had gotten that, like, uh, the dollar bin from my birthday. Oh. You know, and then from there, it's like, you gotta really suck now to win my heart. You you know, to lose my heart. You gotta really just be an awful fucking person. Yeah. (laughs) You know. And it wasn't awful. So I love it. (laughs) You know. Hey, well, it was, it was uh, directed by Bruce McCullough from Kids in the Hall. Yeah. So I, I don't think that it's possible done by Bruce McCullough. I love that man. And they, at least that character, I mean, that character, of course, had a shtick, and he did the shtick. But there was a lot more direction to go with with how to pad that character out. You know? Yeah. You can really play with an yeah. awkward young girl in a Catholic school. You know, Will yeah. Farrell's Will Farrell's appearance as Jesus probably one of the best mm. Jesuses I've seen. Very, very nice Jesus. <laughs> very nice Jesus. I think I would have to put him third. You know, so it would be like the Buddy Christ. Buddy Christ, very nice. Ed Wood's Christmas card, and then Will Farrell. I've always had a soft spot for the movie uh, Jesus, so I'd have to put, I'd have to put that Christ up there. Yeah. So I really love. It. It's I have a, I have a weakness for a a very small amount of musicals, and that's one of them. Yeah. And again, my parents never fully understood me or got me really. So I, they, they didn't care too much what I did sometimes. So sometimes I would just stay up really late if there was like, oh, hey, they're going to show this monster movie at 1 a.m. So, I, you know, I just stay up right. and watch these movies and all this weird stuff. And I, Superstar, and I had heard of Jesus Christ Superstar on an old episode of Mod. It was a rerun of in town to finally see Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah, and I thought. They're playing Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, that was the movie that Maude went to go see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay up and I'm going to watch this. And the next day, I had some questions. So I went to my mom and I'm, I said, Mom, did Jesus have a bus? <laughs> and she's like, no, Stevie, Jesus didn't have a bus. Why would you say that? You shouldn't say that about Jesus. Well, I was watching this movie last night and Jesus had a bus with all the and they were dancing. She, she didn't fully understand. I just got in trouble for saying bad things about Jesus. <laughs> and and if he didn't really have the bus, then the tanks are probably right out. Yeah, like there there were tanks and they they were dancing. I have questions, but nope, nope, not at all. Okay, so the next Saturday Night Live movie is The Ladies' Man from the year 2000. The Ladies' Man. Um, I like this movie. Tim Meadows, he used to do that character and he'd be drinking Cavassier. Uh, Leon Phelps, The Ladies' Man. And he's like this super romantic advice I can't imagine this. I can't imagine that the movie was successful, but I can't even uh, place the character. Man. 
I think I totally missed this it, character. I, I, I think I like this movie only because of how of Saturday Night Live at the time. Yeah. I really, really like this movie. It's just, just a silly, stupid movie. Okay, so the last Saturday Night Live movie to be made was 2010, and that This movie absolutely bombed. Uh, it it was budgeted at ten million dollars and it made nine million dollars. It is uh, it absolutely bombed. Everybody hated it. Uh, what, what was the title again? Movie of uh, MacGyver. It stars Will Forte and Ryan Philippi and uh, Kristen Wiig. Yeah, I I think I totally missed that too. Well, you know we are coming into the later cycle, which sort of makes sense. I think. Yeah, yeah. I am. The movie is really horrible, but the movie is so horrible that it's an amazing thing to watch. And actually, they're they're working on a sequel now. Yeah. Because the first one was so horrible that now there's interest in seeing if they can actually make a second one. So that's a bit uh, frightening. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's my list of Saturday Night Live movies. I have another list here that I find uh, quite interesting. Yeah. It's, a list just, I, it's a list. Just to come back mm-hmm. to the documentary real quick, though, out of this cast, yes. the, only one, the only ones I recognized was uh, Bill Hader. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I, I love him, but I want to hit him. Um, and wasn't that the guy from Hot Rod? Who was actually the stuntman? He, not Bill Hader. I know Bill Hader was in Hot not, Rod. Bill Hader was in Hot Rod, but, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Saturday Night Live at the time. A- Andy Samberg. Yeah, he just had darker hair in the documentary, it looked like. Yeah, and he wore glasses a lot. Yeah. In the documentary. So what is your next list? Next list is a list of people who were once SNL cast members and failed miserably. Uh, okay. I think this is a pretty darn good list. And I have a really big name who used to be the yeah. cast member, but I'm going to save him for last. Okay. So famous people cast members and failed. Uh, Silverman. Right. Passed from 1993 to 1994. And then I, she was either fired or quit. I don't remember which. But I I am in love with her. Yeah. I want to have, I want to have her babies. She is amazing. And I am in love with her. Uh, Janine Garofalo was on for about half a season and then she yeah she quit because she was upset at how much of a club Saturday Night Live was and they weren't giving a chance to women and she was all upset and she left in a huff and there was a big um, controversy and that sucks because if she she would have been with a really strong cast of women like Molly Shannon and all of that but she quit um Gilbert Godfrey Gilbert Godfrey he did a turn okay uh yeah 1980 to 1981 it was such a really bad cast that they didn't even do like a full season that was uh during that whole Charlie Rocket phase yeah I don't remember I don't remember Gilbert Godfrey from that at all I can't, no one remembers him from that. But that whole cast of people, Kelly Rocket and Ann Risley, all of these forgetful people, they were all fired, Joe Piscopo and Eddie Murphy, and they ended up like saving SNL. Well, more Eddie Murphy, because Joe Piscopo's success. Oh, he's awful. But, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know, he, don't, you, don't you pick up the feel on there that it was like, oh, well, we got to keep a token white guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. A, a lot of, of uh, my notes here 
come from a really wonderful book. It's called Live from New York, an Uncensored History of Saturday Night Live. Yeah. It's an absolutely wonderful book. And the best thing about it is it came out a couple of years ago. But um, in celebration of Saturday Night Live's 40th anniversary, they decided to update the book. So now there's like a whole 50 page long new chat. And now the authors of the book, their plan is, is just to constantly write this book for as long as Saturday Night Live is living. As long as Saturday Night Live is around, they're going to keep updating the book. That's so it, a good gig. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. The book is our phone book size book. But there's a wonderful quote on there where they say, early 80s period of Saturday Night Live, they say, Eddie Murphy's success went to Joe Piscopo's head. <laughs> And that's just so wonderful and so true. It's, oh, it's spot on, man. It is so spot on. Yeah. And one of the things that they say, too, that I thought was interesting was people would get so fucking pissed off at Joe Piscopo because of how... Because uh, Joe Piscopo did a really good Frank Sinatra impression. Yes. Yes, he did. He did do, like, an amazing spot on Frank Sinatra impression. In fact, he did a Frank Sinatra tell that Frank Sinatra loved Joe Piscopo's impression and became friends with them on the town and Joe Piscopo would be backstage at his concerts and they became really close friends. So, so when Saturday Night Live would say, okay, Joe, we're going to have you dressed as Frank Sinatra snorting Coke. And then Joe Piscopo would say, oh, but the Frank I know would never do that. Oh, God. So, assholey because he was such good friends with Frank and the boys that he couldn't do that to Frank. Like, what a fucking dick you are. <laughs> like, fucking seriously. That is, like, that's horrible. But um, let's continue on our list of famous people who are SNL cast members and failed miserably. Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller. Missed those years, too. Okay. 1988 to 19... 19- he lasted for one season. He only had one character that was in any way popular, and he was an older Eddie Munster. That, no, yeah, I was wondering if that's where he was doing the Eddie Munster bit. Yeah. Okay. With that, he, he, parlayed, he parlayed his appearance on SNL into his own show, The Ben Stiller Show, which uh, is a really good show, but it, I don't think it lasted a full season. Um, I'm adding her on the list because she's really famous now, but I don't think she failed at SNL. Uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus from Seinfeld. She was yeah. Elaine. And now she has her own show, Veep, where she's the vice president. And it's really, really funny. And she's just an amazingly talented Emmys. And good for her, but... I think people forget that she was on Saturday Night Live, so I kept her on. Yeah. yeah. Well, what? let's put it this way, I guess, is that huh. these are the people that were not made famous by Saturday Night Live. Yes. Whereas yes, Saturday yes. Night Live made a lot of careers. It made Eddie Murphy. It yeah. made Bill Murray. You know. Five for like a fortnight that I found interesting. Anthony Michael Hall. I, I vaguely remember him being on for a little while, and I was like, I, I can't watch that. I... It's interesting because, number one, he played Chevy Chase's son in <laughs> National Anthem Vacation. Yeah. So there's, a, so there's an SNL connection there. And also there's a connection to our podcast because he was in the episode where we talked about the movie. That so is. there's a connection to an old episode there. So everybody who's listening now, if you haven't listened to that podcast episode, you should go back and listen to it because it's a good episode. I really think there are a lot more people out there listening than we really know of. Yeah. All I can see is numbers. Write us, yeah. people. Pope at film. <laughs> Pope at undeadcow.com. Yes. Or hit us up on Facebook or Stitcher. Especially Stitcher. I love Stitcher. But now we've we've gotten to the biggest name. Uh, 
uh, on my list of famous people who are SNL cast members and failed. This oh. is the biggest name. And I'm really, really excited. Like anyone knows this. People, everyone knows this. Tony Jr. was a cast member on SNL. Who was a cast member? Robert Downey. Robert Downey Jr. No. Iron Man was a cast member of SNL. Huh. Is, is that... In, is, because in 1980, um, uh, Lauren Michaels wanted like a six months to a year off because he was getting burned out. But the studio network said no, so he... Until 1995, and he's been with the. But in 1980, what the NBC network pretty much took over SNL, and they tried to reboot it, and it was a disastrous failure. Except they kept Piscopo and Murphy, and they ended up saving it through, through like 1980 to 1980. In 84, Eddie Murphy became huge, and he left. But then when Lorne Michaels came back, he said, "Okay, well we're going to give SNL a." Hired all of these people, uh, Randy Quaid, right. Anthony, Anthony Michael Hall, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Joan Cusack. People. But it was a huge, huge, huge act, like five or six times in which SNL almost died. Yeah. But John Lovitz was on there and Dennis Miller, and they ended up staying on there them led SNL into that whole new era where there was, you know, Dana Carvey and Phil Hartman and Kevin Nealon. I always liked I a fan of Kevin Nealon. Yeah, I, he's one of those people I like and I don't really know why. Yeah, he's just some strange, likable person. Anyway, you would I hang and have other... a couple of beers with him. You know, you would sit yeah, back. Yeah, he would. He would. He's amazing on the show Weeds, too. Oh, he's on that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. My wife had a huge weeds fade for, phase for a while. Yeah. She was just obsessed with it. So I have um, uh, Keenan Thompson. Do you know who Keenan Thompson is? I don't know if you know who Keenan Thompson is. Name does not even strike a bell. He was one of two uh, young African-American actors on the Nickelodeon show All That. And they they became kind of a popular show called the Keenan and Kel show, and they played a bunch of different characters. And one of the two characters, one of the characters they used to do all the time were these two weird slackers who worked at a restaurant called Good Burger. And then they turned which full. I I think uh what's his name? Uh Fish from Barney Miller. Abe Vagoda. Abe Vagoda was in it. And I respect Abe Vagoda because any man who could be in both Godfather and Good Burger goes to amazing places. But um I always liked Keenan and Kel, and I always thought, oh, hey, I wonder, I wonder where these kids are going to go in their career. And then Kel. Well, now, when, uh, you, when you say their names together, they sound a lot more familiar. Yeah, Keenan and Kel. They had that Good Burger movie, and it was kind of all over the place when it came out. There were previews and posters and all that. So, so they went their separate ways. Kel got a fairly big starring role. But Mystery Men bombed, and that's a damn shame because that's an amazing movie, and everybody should have seen it a billion times in the theater. The movie was ahead of its time. It, it totally, That's exactly what I was thinking, man. It was totally ahead of its time. And if they did it now, you know, may, maybe they could do a re-release. It would be as popular as hell. Yeah. It's a superhero movie parody, but superhero movies weren't all... Now, now superhero movies are like a business... And if that movie had come out now, yeah, it would be absolutely huge. Yeah, I think but... it was. I think it was too pitched to the fans, and there weren't enough fans going out to see that kind of movie yet. Yeah. If it if it if it came out now, yeah, absolutely, it would be damn 
huge. But so he was like the invisible boy in that one, right? Yeah, he was the invisible boy in that. Okay. But uh, but Keenan didn't do anything, and I was like, oh well, is Kel gonna be the star? But then that movie bombed, and Kel did absolutely nothing. And then Keenan got on Saturday Night Live. He was one of the featured players, also starring guys, starting in the 2003 season of Saturday Night Live. Well, he is still on the show. Real? Okay, good. It's 2015, and somehow Keenan, all that, is still on Saturday Night Live. He's one of the, he's, he, out of everyone who is on the cast of Saturday Night Live, he is the one who is. And that's amazing to me because, wow, he's from Nickelodeon. He's from Good Burger. He's from Nickelodeon's All That. They used to play him and then Rugrats. And somehow he's like on Saturday Night Live. It's a really big deal. And he changed the face of Saturday Night Live recently because for the longest time, it was just him being the only black person on Saturday Night Live. Right. Then they hired, then they hired Jay Farrow, and he's, he's an amazing impressionist. He can do any uh, black celebrity. He's quite amazing. He's, he's like, a, like a black Phil Hartman. But um, there were no black females. The last black female who, who was on Saturday Night Live joined the cast in 1990. And that's a remarkably long time for Saturday Night Live to not hire a black woman. So Keenan Thompson started getting kind of pissed off about it. So they asked him to do Whoopi Goldberg in drag for like a skit on The View, and he refused to. Yeah. And suddenly... There was this whole movement of, oh, hey, SNL doesn't like black people. So Lorne Michaels decided to highly make up for it. So he hired Jay Farrow. So there's two black people on the show. Right. And then he then he hired a black female who's on the show, and she's really good. Her name is Sashir Zameda. Okay. And then they wanted – then they so there's three black people. So then – try somebody different on Weekend Update. So they got one of the writers, Michael Che, to be on Weekend Update, and he's black. So there's four black people on Saturday Night Live. But then they got one of the female writers to do a uh, monologue on Weekend Update, and she did this bit about slavery that, that was really controversial and got people pissed off. Okay. So Lauren Michaels... So Lauren Michael said, well, how about we hire you for the cast? So now there's two black females on the show. There are five black people on the show. And I don't mean this in a racist way, but Saturday it is a very black show now. Yeah. And that's wonderful because Saturday Night Live is like, I don't, I don't know black culture enough to know if uh black culture actually likes this or cares about it or watches it saturday night live has never been it's now saturday night live can are they're doing a lot of shows a lot of skits about black people and black culture and what it's like to be a minority in america and that's pretty it feels like a much different show than it used to be they do a lot more like, like sometimes it reminds me of uh, um, and they would do a 12 minute movie in the middle of Saturday Night Live, you know? Right. It, it sounds interesting, though. It does it sound is. interesting. It is. It's quite interesting. And, and also, it's interesting to think, again, that Keenan freaking Thompson changed the face of Saturday Night Live. He was on Nickelodeon. And he just changed the face of one of the oldest comedies in American history on television. That's quite amazing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's enough history. What did you think of the documentary? Uh, I had a hard time hooking in because it's not my cast. So like I had yeah. said, it, it was two. There were two people there that I recognized, not counting John, John Malkovich. Uh, it was yeah. it was interesting to see a show get put together 
Yes. But I was also looking at it being like, man, this is a fucking big ass production these days. You know? Yeah. They have yeah. to have they have to have several floors of that building there. You know, and there are tons and tons of people. Yeah, like a sh- Yeah. So it was interesting from that standpoint, but it it was also kind of like how do you keep control over that much going on? Yeah. And you didn't really used to need that much going on. Well, like I, I, I had some questions about this uh, documentary. So I, I looked up and found it, it was information about, about the, it was filmed by who made this. It, and uh, it was in December 2008. That was so long ago. George Bush was still president. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. That was a that was a while ago. He originally meant it to short film of just about uh uh what's his name Bill Hader. Okay. It was supposed to be a nine minute short film for his NYU film school class because James Franco was trying to get a degree or whatever to be a filmmaker so um but while he was trying to um get the rights to do this short film about bill Hader, lauren michael said well we'll give you uh, full access saturday night live so that's when james franco said well if i'm gonna have i'll just make a, a documentary about saturday night live because no one's done this Again, so if I have the chance, I might as well make this into a big, huge movie. But that's why Bill Hader gets such a massive amount of screen time in this. Yes, he did Bill get Hader's a lot like of screen time. time. Yeah, Bill which Hader's frankly, like which frankly made me happy because I like him, but I want to hit him. I might have told this story yeah. on the show before. I am not sure though. Okay, go for it. But um. A friend of mine passed me a script one day for a movie he wanted to make, and it made my eyes bleed. It was so bad. I think you have told this story before, but go ahead, tell it, tell it. I think it was a long time ago. Yeah, so I was like, you know, I'm feeling kind of generous, and I kind of want to play with this this idea anyway. Um. It's it's a basic teen horror movie kind of a thing. Um, and everybody was generic. You know, like, he wrote in a witch. Didn't describe the witch. Didn't give the witch any kind of character. Just kind of gotcha. gave her witchly lines. <laughs> and then at the end, to end this horror movie, the police show up. And there's no character to the police or anything like that. You know, it's like, well, those are the police. You should know how they are. Kind of a thing, you know? It's a witch. You should know how witches are, you know? So I rewrite this. And I am, you know, like, part of me is like, I'm going to show this bitch how this should be done. (laughs) You know? Nice. Kind of a feeling. Yeah. So I wrote well, the cops only came at the end, so I wrote them in earlier so that it made more sense for them to come in at the end. Yeah. And they would basically sit in their p- patrol car and puff it out like Cheech and Chong. Because <laughs> cops got the best weed. We all know that saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, Obviously. And then they would they would go around and find wherever kids were having parties and shit. And in this script, there was a big party going on in the woods. A rave. So <laughs> they basically follow the music until they find the rave and they shake down the kids for all their drugs. Go back to the patrol car and start doing them up. I'm not even sure if I was finished writing the script when I saw Super Bad with Bill Hader. Ah, yes. Where he, yes. Where he and uh, Seth Rogen basically played 
my two cups. And it was like, son of a bitch. Well, it's a good thing this script is never getting made, so who cares, really? Sure. <laughs> you know? But, yeah, so I, I absolutely loved Bill Hader because it's like, fuck, that's what I'm trying to get at. That's That's what I'm doing over here. That's, you know. And then at the same time, I was like, okay, well, now it's been done. People have seen that. I, you know, I will forever just be ripping off super bad. <laughs> you know? So, love, hate. Yeah, that's understandable. Uh, hold on a second. I think Maxwell wants to be on the podcast. Say hello, Maxwell. Hello, podcast. Oh, my God, that was cute. Say that again. Say hello, podcast. <laughs> hello, podcast. Very nice. <laughs> say, say. Very nice. Baby. Very nice. Very nice. You go and play, okay? okay. Um another thing, another thing about this documentary being about Bill Hader originally is that meant that a lot of this whole documentary is a big sausage fest. Yes. It most certainly see, is. You see so much of the guys and you see just nonstop guys because I think James Frank is a bro. Uh-huh. Bro documentary about his bros and all of that. But there are there were some really good women that were on the cast of Kristen Wig is only like a like a cameo in this movie. Yeah. And uh, oh, Amy Poehler shows up for about five seconds and that's about it. And it's it's surprising. But I think that that's because James Franco is just James Franco is just trying to do. I, I'm I am a huge I am a huge Saturday Night Live fan, and I had a hard time watching this. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's just it. It's a student film. Sure, the student is James Franco, but this is a student. Yeah. Film. It looks it's, a lot it's rough. It looked a lot better than other student films, and he def- definitely had more access. I mean, a regular film student would not get to talk to Lauren Michaels at all. Yeah, but it, it's rough. It's most of the movie looks just insanely dim. The camera work is shaky. It it feels like like another Zap Ruder film. Right, uh, like a like a terrorist training video that they're showing on the news. Well, James Franco himself, I I, I kind of have a bit of love hate with him as well, and I really kind of equate him to what I think about Ben Affleck. You know, okay. It seems like both of these people, when they are doing a movie with their friends. And they're in a place where they're comfortable and things like that. They do a knockout job, you know, like Ben Affleck and Chasing Amy. That that's like close to one of his uh, best performances, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. But he's doing it with Kevin Smith. He's a friend, so I don't think he gives a shit. You know, he's just gonna go for it. He's gonna be relaxed, and he's not really gonna care that much about what he's doing. He's just gonna do it. You get him with somebody like Michael Bay or something like that in like Armageddon. That's one of my favorite Michael Bay movies. And he's awful. You know, yes, he's, he he's wooden. All of the emotions seem really forced. And James Franco strikes me very much the same way. If he's doing something with Seth Rogen or something along that line, he is amazing. You put him in something yeah. else. You put him in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I didn't like him mm. in that movie. You put him in a Great and Powerful Oz. He looks like he's acting. You know? I I like the movie The Great and Powerful Oz, but I think I only liked it because I saw it in a drive-in theater. Yeah. And I don't think that it's possible for me to hate something when I'm at a drive-in theater. It's just so good We to be in there. Uh, we have now this is the polar opposite of a drive-in but up in denver which is only about 60 miles away 
we have okay. an Alamo Draft House, and I saw I saw uh, it I saw uh, it at the Alamo uh, Draft House. Oh uh, yeah, man, you got yeah, your, that's gonna be amazing. You got your chairs. You got a little table in front of you. You got little ninja waitresses running around and shit. You give them slips of paper. They bring you bowls of fucking popcorn and shit. And alcohol if you want it. Yeah. We have something we have something like the Alamo Draft House. It's called the Warren Theater. And yeah. it's like this big, huge, massive thing. And it's two stories. And it's got an IMAX in it. And it's really, really nice. But there's one main theater. And it's huge. The balcony is only for 21 and up. And you sit down. And you've got assigned seats. And the seats are twice the size of normal seats. And there's a button to warm up your seat if you want, like, your butt warmed up. And nice. there's a button There's a button you press. And, like, yeah, like a ninja waitress will show up and get you food or drinks. And there's a little, like, a, like a desk that, that appears that you can make appear on your seat where you can eat food mm-hmm. and drink while you're watching the movie. Yeah. I did that for 21 Jump Street. And I really liked 21 Jump Street. Nice. I, 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 so, well, yeah. I mentioned this before. I loved, I loved Johnny Depp's quote unquote cameo yeah. in that movie. I thought he, I thought he went above and beyond the do, call of duty for what he needed to do, you know? Yeah. This, this documentary answered to, it answered a really big mystery to something from this. Yeah. Uh, at, Occasionally, I will watch the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. I really like Jimmy. I really like Jimmy Fallon. I really like what he's done with the Tonight Show. You know, he's really. Oh, God, I, I hate it. Oh, I just when I think of Johnny Carson and I think of Jimmy, skip over massive period in time when Jay Leno hosted because I always fucking hated him so hard. I I know man I hated him in his stand up oh. act before oh. he was even being considered there were so many other people why not Letterman you know I mean uh, uh, yeah 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 I'm feeling you brother I'm feeling you <laughs> I just I absolutely he did Jay Leno so much, and he was on for so goddamn long, he just wouldn't fucking give it up. So I'm just so happy that now there's someone hosting the Tonight Show, and he's young, and he's he's uh, you know he's trending, he's on YouTube, and people are liking him, and it's just it feels so good. But when I see the Tonight Show, he's got like a like his sidekick, his announcer, mm-hmm. his uh, uh, Ed McMahon off to the side. Yeah. And I always thought it was weird because here's Jimmy Fallon and he's all young and he's really funny and his sidekick is like a like a 49 year old guy and he's pudgy and it's just why is he there? I always wondered like who is he? Mm-hmm. Why is he there? He seems kind of funny. He gets in a one liner every once in a while, but why is he there and who is he? He was the producer of Saturday Night Live. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Was the producer from like 2004 to like 2012. He was the producer and he was there in glasses and stuff and he was really funny and he was helping everybody write and stuff like that. And I'm like, holy shit, that's the guy who's uh, Jimmy Fallon's freaking sidekick on The Tonight Show. Jimmy Fallon must have stolen him probably because they uh, got along so well. But that really solved a huge, huge mystery for me. I was really happy about that. Yeah. Cool. It was it was nice to see that this was done before Don Pardo died, and oh, you Don and you Pardo. have a quick little scene of Don Pardo just doing his thing, and that warmed the cockles of my heart. Yeah. That yeah. that turned me into a little twelve year old girl again. I I so died. And then they got, uh, oh, what's his name? He's doing the announcers, now, the announcing now, Daryl Hammond. Daryl Hammond is doing the announcing for Saturday Night Live now. And I was excited about that 
that because when Daryl Hammond was on the cast of Saturday Night Live, he was really good at impressions. Wasn't so he Bill Clinton? Day, yeah, yeah, he was Bill Clinton. Uh, Don Pardo got so sick that for the first missed doing the announcing for Saturday Night Live. So Daryl Hammond said, well, I'm good at impressions. I can do a Don Pardo. So he actually did an impression of Don Pardo doing the announcing on Saturday Night Live. And he was so good that nobody knew that it was at Ham and Don Pardo. So when I heard that Don and Daryl Hammond to do the announcing, I was, I assumed, do them as Don Pardo. But he does not. He announces every Saturday Night Live, but he does it as Daryl Hammond and not as Don Pardo. And it's just so different. Yeah. It's so different to watch that show and to hear those credits and then go, it's Saturday. <laughs> With your host, James Franco. And now here's your host. It's just so different. I was hoping he would do a Don Pardo, but he's not doing a Don Pardo. He's doing a him. And that really upset me. Yeah. Another thing, another thing that upset me, I really liked that skit they wrote for Empire Carpets. I, I like the that. documentary. Yeah. I really liked that skit because if because I have TV, everybody knows my love of TV. So I have repeatedly seen that five, eight, eight, two, three hundred M. And, it, you know, it, it stuck in Bill. And it got cut during dress rehearsal. I was really upset about that. I was really hoping. I, I, the weird thing, too, is that I know Saturday Night Live so much. Documentary, I knew, like, right from the beginning, it's like, okay, well, that skit stays in. <laughs> that skit stays in. I remember seeing that skit about the calculator. So, yeah, that one stayed in. I don't remember seeing this I'm sure about Empire Carpets, but I'm sure that that skit stayed. Even though I don't think I've seen this episode since it aired, like way back then. Yeah. But that just shows you how much I love Saturday Night Live. My parents is, didn't do much to me, but they passed along a a love of mambo music, okay. a love of. They passed along a, a love of Coors, a love of Saturday Night Live. All of my life, I've been watching Saturday Night Live. My dad would tell me that, that you know, when he was young, he would be, you know, when before I was born, he would be watching the first season of Saturday Night Live. In, uh, back then, he lived in um, he lived Bullhead City, Texas. Okay. He lived in Bullhead City, Texas. A small town and nobody was watching Saturday Night Live. Nobody had any idea what it was in this small town, but he would be watching it every week and he loved it. He even loved those weird um Jim Henson skits. Oh, the Jim Henson the yeah, season. the Saturday Night Live Muppets, yeah. Yeah, the land of Gorch. Yes. I think is what it's called. In the book they mention that um a, a, except for one skit. All of the Land of Gorge skits were written by SNL writers. So what they would do is they would draw straws. And whoever got the shortest straw had to write the stupid Muppet skit. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, they and weren't I that think good. That's... And hey, speaking of The Tonight Show, we have uh, Johnny Carson to thank for the creation of Saturday Night Live. How so? Because... Um, because um, uh, every, from 1965 to 1975, every Saturday night, MTV, uh, not MTV, uh, NBC would play the best of Carson reruns. And they would play them oh, from 1965. You know? yeah. But Carson wanted to be pulled and moved to the weekday so that he could have more time off. It's amazing to think that when John that Mondays he would it would be like a Jay Leno or um, that chick who just died whom I never liked Joan Rivers, Rivers. Yeah. and then 
And then Tuesdays would be a best of. He would only work three days a week. He would only be actually hosting his own show Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. But he was still, like, huge. But he wanted the reruns pulled from Saturday night to the weekday so he could have more time off. Uh, He had so much time off, but he was still huge. But they needed to fill something for for, uh, that Saturday night. So then Lorne Michaels created, originally it was titled NBC Saturday Night. It took a while for it to be called Saturday Night Live. And another thing that you got to thank uh, uh, Lorne Michaels for is that when years between 1980 and 1980, another network. It was called The New Show. It lasted less than 13 episodes and it bombed. But then also, he went back to his native land of Canada and helped create the kids in the hall. Well, there once Saturday Night Live popped, there was a lot of other stuff that uh, of a similar vein that popped. Uh, like Fridays. Like Fridays. That's, that, that was like their major right. competitor, but they really couldn't pe- compete. Um, except for the famous Andy Kaufman episode. And there was also on HBO, there was a show called Not Necessarily the News. Not Necessarily the News. Yeah. Wow. Where they just tried to concentrate on the weekend update part and do a show like that. And that's where we got What's-His-Name with the Sniglets. Remember the Sniglets? Remember the Sniglets? I remember the Sniglets because there's a there's an episode of um, Cheap Seats where he's doing stand up comedy at a at a on some episode and they say what is the Sniglet for uh, for a career down the toilet or something <laughs> like that what what's the for a man who doesn't have a job anymore I can't even think of that something dude's like name that. was it Rich Hall or something like that. Hall, yes, Rich Hall. I was going to say Rich Little, but Rich Little did the impression, so Rich Hall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say Rich Hall is just the Sniglet. He's a living Sniglet. <laughs> he is a living Sniglet, yeah. Uh, what else, great. man? There were a few others, too, that died horrible deaths. Those weren't the only ones, but ensemble comedy shows that would kind of fall into that variety show almost or sketch comedy category um i never liked mad tv uh i never liked that show but it did that's probably what finally drove me to giving up cable because it seemed to be on everywhere too yeah so i wound up watching a lot of it uh through with protest you know like yeah. seriously this is the best thing on yeah it's yeah. either this or the food network those are my choices and i'm paying how much for this shit <laughs> god yeah so i watched i watched a lot of them i can't think of anything you, you know I, I like a couple of things if they had only done it once or twice. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like that Stewart kid that we talked about a few shows back. Um, yes, in the episode The Death Artist, where we talked about the death artist and a bucket of blood and yes. the similarities and differences. You should check that out if you haven't heard that episode of the podcast. It's a good one. Uh, it is still out there. You can download it or get it on YouTube, either one. Uh, you know, like, he was funny in little doses. But when it comes up every episode and it's it's just the same shit and the same thing with yep. with that Mrs. Swan character and a lot uh-huh. of I can't think of a character that I really liked. Yeah, I can't I can't think of anything kind of came down only- to I, I, I don't hate this one that much. <laughs> you know, that sort of. A yeah. Thing. Yeah. I wanted to talk about something. I I'm, I may have mentioned this earlier in a previous podcast, but there's there's a, a Lorne Michaels thing that just blows my mind. So Lorne Michaels helped he created Saturday Night Live, and he also helped create Kids in the Hall. Yes. 
Lord Michaels has a very interesting way of acting, a very interesting way of talking. He has this strange voice. He has this strange accent, this bizarre way that he talks. Yeah. Right? Very strange cadence you, to his voice, yeah. Yeah. So the kids in the hall went off and made a movie. And independent of that, Rain Mike Panthers. Myers... Yeah. Yeah. And independent of that, my power... Now, I hated Austin Powers, too, and I hate it, but that movie, did we just lose the connection again? Uh, we were chopping up a little there. We didn't lose anything, though. Uh, Austin Powers movie is a really good parody of 60s movies, and I, I, I really like the first one, and, and they use a lot of silence in it, which I respect in a comedy movie. Yeah. where you can just have silence for a long period of time. But both of these movies, Austin Powers and The Kids in the Hall Brain Candy, yeah. who are based on... So, although Dr. Evil in no way looks like the head of Rorator Pharmaceuticals, they... In the exact same manner of, because they're both based on Lauren Michaels. Oh, okay. Be absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Austin Powers, it, that uh, Doctor Evil sounds exactly like. Uh, Look, do we are we ever going to get the big tree in here? Am I going to have to go down and cut down that fucking tree myself? Is the exact. Why. <laughs> Because they're both based on the same man, and that's just, I find that absolute, it is, I find that amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who would you consider to be your favorite, your favorite SNL cast member oh. of all time? Man, that is such a tough one. Uh, of all time. I'd have to. I would have to go with the safe choice and go with Phil Hartman. Um, that reminded me of a story that I read in the book Life from New York. Oh, oh, yeah. But let me interrupt you for a second. That yeah. is actually my favorite episode of the Coneheads that Saturday Night Live ever did. There was there was oh. one episode where Phil Hartman and that cast did the Coneheads. And they did like a serious version of the Coneheads. One part has Phil Hartman staring into the mirror. Beldar, it's time for you to stop consuming mass quantities. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's 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 Phil Hartman's Conehead, like hitting rock bottom on his alcoholism. It was so. It was nice. so funny. So go ahead. Nice. Sorry for interrupting. Um, God, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. There was a story in the book Live from New York, an uncensored history of SNL that I've been telling everybody about because I think it's wonderful. They they talked to um, Chris Rock about Chris Farley. And yeah. he tells this story, and it's really wonderful. And he says, okay, I'm going to tell you a story. I have an Two interesting guys. story there. Go ahead with yours. I'll tell you mine after. So Chris Rock says, okay, I'm both named Chris. They were hired on the same day. One is from the projects, very poor life, very dangerous life. The other one is from a well-off family in, um, in uh, Wisconsin. Now, which one do you think is going to OD? <laughs> I, 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 would, I, just I would go with Chris Rock. I love that story. That's absolutely wonderful. I've been thinking about that a lot because I got Saturday Night Live. I'm really excited about their 40th anniversary um, uh, live special. It's going to be your 16th. Yeah. On NBC. The last time they did one of these live specials, it lasted way too long and it was quite controversial. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Uh, Eddie Murphy is going to be on it. It'll be his first appearance since he left Saturday Night Live. He has never came back to SNL. So now Chris Farley, uh, one of the successful ones that had left Saturday Night Live, 
uh, had become really good friends with John Hughes and was in a couple of John Hughes, some of the things that John Hughes did right around that time. Kind of after John Hughes was really good anyway. But they had become really good friends, and he, John Hughes kept trying to get Chris Farley to stop living the lifestyle that he was living. And when Chris Farley died, John Hughes said, you know what, Hollywood killed him. And that's when he quit making movies, and that's when he went into seclusion. Huh. That is interesting. I I didn't that Coneheads movie was <laughs> in that uh, Chris Farley's in the Cone and Sinbad, but that's just weird. Sinbad, whatever happened to him? He's a sniglet. Sinbad is a sniglet. I saw Sinbad live when I was a, a sophomore in high school. Yeah, he, he played the Arizona State Fair. Oh man! Yeah, parachute pants. Was he opening for Ario Speedwagon or Def Leppard? No, no, it was just him. He was the headliner. Because we have a state fair here. I've never gone. Um, I've went to one once, not here, I, and it's just really not my form of entertainment. But we get the announcements on the radio, and and every time it, it makes me want to cry all the time as they're announcing who they have at the state fair and they have had Def Leppard and they have had Oreo Speedwagon. And it's just like, Oh man, well, you know, I, I guess it's good. You're still working, <laughs> you know, you're doing something. You're still, nothing. You're still rocking. Nothing, nothing beats the Arizona. Yeah. There was one year at the Arizona state fair. I saw in, uh, uh, Stone Temple Pilots, and then like a like four or five days later, Nirvana. Well, and this then, is as they were coming up, right? Yeah, and then a week yeah. later, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah, and that's all in one year at the Arizona. Most amazing stuff. Like one, like uh, last year at the Oklahoma State Fair, they had like a Beatles tribute band and a bunch of uh, a bunch of country people I had never heard of. To myself, I looked and and saw who was playing at the Arizona State Fair, and they had like they had and I, and Kiss, and it's like too much about them, but I care about them more than whoever the hell the country people are that are playing right now at the Oklahoma State Fair. <laughs> it sets me that the Arizona State Fair is still beating the other state fairs. Uh, I, I would say so, yeah. Because those are definitely people who could be doing something else if they wanted to. And the, the California State Fair I used to really like because Weirdo Yankovic would come almost every year. And I love Weirdo Yankovic. That would be just, awesome. Just, yeah. Just the idea, the concept that, that I used to listen to this musical artist when I was a kid and now I have kids and they're listening to him and these amazing parodies. It's just quite amazing to me. There aren't too many other artists that I can say that about, you know? Oh, no, yeah, no. I, I have so much respect for him, and he is, there is so much intelligence in what he does that hopefully he goes down in history as a Mozart or a Beethoven or something like that, although I'm kind of afraid he'll be penalized because he's doing comedy, you know? Yeah, yeah. What do you think we should do for next week? Uh, there's something I am interested in doing, um, because it is kind of a kind of a thing that we have not yet touched on, but we're gonna do it sooner or later, so we might as well do it. Kind of the same way that we did Godzilla. Uh, when I was on Daily Motion, I got to poking around and I fl- found the uh, full version of. Boris Karloff's Frankenstein. I am thinking it's probably time for a Universal movie, a Universal monster movie. 
That I, a friend of mine, Anne Bride of Frankenstein. So I think the both go hand in hand. You want to do the both of them? They do go hand in hand and very well. And they are, oh man. Well, let me not shoot my wad now. <laughs> But yes, yeah. we we could definitely do Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein, especially since the original Frankenstein is really fairly short. Yeah, I don't yeah. even I don't th- even think it's eighty minutes. Yeah, I think it is either something like an hour and ten or something like that. So, oh yeah, we could definitely back up on those two. Yeah. Maxwell say, this is an awesome podcast. This is an awesome podcast. <laughs> that was good. Good job. You get a you get a sugar cookie. Yeah. I, I Maxwell. Might, Maxwell, I, do you want to watch Frankenstein? Yeah. Say yay, Frankenstein. Yay, Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, I'm down for that. Double feature. Okay. Sounds good. Sweet. Let's do that, man. Yeah. All right. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> I, I I might clip Maxwell out, and he might be the permanent star of the show. I'd be that'd be okay. That'd be okay. Like I'd would, be all right with that. Like it would start with this is an awesome podcast, and then it would go into the music, and then it would go into yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be sweet. So let's do that. Okay. Our, it sounds like we're winding up. Is that what we're doing here? Yeah, my 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 kids are going nuts. Okay, cool. Cool. So is my bladder. So, so I'm Sweet. down with that. <laughs> All right. So, uh, the Pope on Film, you can find us in the iTunes store. Just search Undead Cow, all one word. And that would bring up all of the podcasts from Undead Cow Studios. Uh, and Really, iTunes is the biggest way of of catching and listening to podcasts. Uh, yeah. We are also on Stitcher. Uh, we seem to have a whole lot of listeners from what I'm seeing. Uh, it, it looks like we are getting about 200 regular downloads a week. So if any of you people out there can go to the Stitcher page, look at our shows there, and tell us what the hell it, it's about. You know, just... Yeah, Drop us a line. Let us it. let us know what the hell this whole Stitcher thing really is. Yeah, we would have an to research it. Uh, yeah. you can like us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for Pope on Film. You can follow us on Twitter at Pope on Film, or you can email us at Pope at UndeadCow dot com, and you can watch the video version of the show on YouTube at undead cow films yay where hey. the babes in the in toyland episode is rocking the house in bulgaria we are huge shout out to all my bulgarianites out there we are the bulgarian mac daddies uh-huh. oh man i want that as a shirt i'd be an <laughs> awesome shirt bulgarian mac daddies and people would be like, "What's that?" And I'd just be like, "Oh, that's just that's just my band, <laughs> you know." So you until know, next we're... week. Sorry. No, I was just talking about the Bulgarian Mac Daddies. <laughs> They're my favorite band now. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams, and with me is Reverend Steve. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you next week, you godless heathens!
you guys.